Hey, buddies, Potato McWhiskey here, and welcome back to Let's Play Civilization VI. Uh, we got ourselves a little bit of a tutorial series. Shout out to my boy, Everlake. We're making him a YouTube series. So, we're going to be covering the medieval era, specifically taking a look at the situation that we are currently in. Now, we have a lot of really important infrastructure coming online for our empire. We are working on our government plaza in Rome. We are considering war with Norway. And the exact nature of that war will probably be horse-based because we did not get any iron inside our empire. But we do have horses over here. And so part of our goal is going to be to efficiently get those tiles online. Now, the best way to get those tiles online is going to be purchasing a builder and then purchasing those tiles but we don't quite have that money yet second best thing we can do is actually talk to another ai and say hey uh d would you like some diplomatic favor what would you give me you would give me maybe some cash so i'm just gonna guess that she would give me like maybe 40 45 something in that region of money you could you could kind of usually guess because uh, one of these gpts is worth about 25 money so you can kind of like figure out roughly how much cash she's willing to give so 53 cash for six of this favor i should then be able to buy a builder uh, the city will grow to the horses, I'm pretty sure, in the next three turns. So really, I just need to get out here and buy this horse to get it online. And the great thing about getting the horses online in Aretium is it'll actually give this city some really good tiles to work, which is going to be super exciting for us to play around with. Now, it is one turn until the next era. Unfortunately, we did not get a Golden Age. I was tempted to see if there was something I could do on that end. But, I, you know, looking around the map, there wasn't really anything I could think of. I kind of would like to build the entertainment complex because the Colosseum is just one of the best wonders in the entire game. There is something to also be said of potentially going for the pyramids. So that's... We kind of want to do a lot of different things in this game. And that's often a bad sign because you can't do everything that you want. It's it's fine. You met Genghis Khan. The first time that you meet someone, it's good to send them a delegation. If they're not willing to send a delegation, you can sometimes ask them for a little bit of cash for your open borders. And that might get you enough. I also don't plan to declare war in Sweden for 30 turns. So I'm going to go ahead and get a friendship with her. Because what you get a friendship with her when oh no never mind she's friendly but she doesn't like me enough to be friends which means she might be considering attacking me so that's an important piece of information actually that i just got from sweden that she likes my civilization but she doesn't consider me a friend which typically right this is an important piece of diplomatic information it means she might be considering going to war with me okay nice there's masonry there's pyramids there's the battering ram and we allow the harvesting of stone now, we would like to get our hands on the pyramids ASAP. We definitely want to be able to get those horses next turn. I think the city is growing to them in two turns, so it's okay if we just wait on that. Let's make sure we get everyone garrisoning. And this extra scout, I have one scout heading north. I think it would be good to send a scout to the south to gather a little bit more intel. There's kind of interesting land over here. We could definitely settle a few cities along this area. Yeah, let's go explore Norway's territory while we have open borders with him. I'm going to go ahead and take free inquiry. The reason that you take free inquiry, every single one of these dedications is an entirely valid thing to take, depending on the type of game that you're playing. Monumentality is quite good if you already have a lot of cities out or you're building a lot of districts. Exodus the Evangelist is really good if you've already gone for a religion and you want to spread that religion to get error score. Penbrush and Voice is probably the weakest one here for trying to generate error score, but it can be useful if you're in a culture game and you do plan to do a lot of these. I would generally say the best one here to pick in almost every scenario outside of the fact that you have a religion or just like you managed to get two settlers really early, like you stole one from a city state or you got one from the Pantheon and you're able to build a couple of extra districts. The free inquiry is the best one because you get that plus one error score each time you trigger a Eureka. And if you build a campus, you'll get another plus one error score. So quite handy that one like and a lot of these boosts are super easy, like find a natural wonder, build a pasture, make a trade route, improve sea resources, build an iron mine, build three different districts, build a water mill, build ancient walls. These are all super easy things, and it's a way for you to effectively, in the early game, when you're going into the medieval era, convert production into era score, giving you a better chance of getting a golden age, and depending on the golden age that you can secure, that can have a big ripple effect on the entire game. Now, I also want to go for the Edamananki here. I do think that this is an Edamananki capital. We have um, what I would consider to be a decent Edamananki. This is a one, two, three, four tile Edamananki. So that, that seems quite good. Potentially even a five tile. One, two, three, four. Yeah, it's a four tile Edamananki. Probably will be three when I build my theater square, if I build my theater square in the capital. Equalia, go ahead and guard that city. Um, now, looking at the city of Equalia, 
when it comes to preparing for war, one of the things that we should potentially build is an encampment to get a great general. This is an okay city to build the encampment in. Boss. I think I would like to wait a little bit for the borders to grow some. Another thing that we could go for is a builder to continue to develop our lands. Uh, we could also just start a settler and expand because we don't plan on really declaring war for quite a while. So that's always an option as well. I would go as far as to say is if you're if you're playing for the long, long, long term, a granary is a really good early pickup in a city and a watermill is fantastic if you have access to Farming resources. Now, farming resources are things like maize, this little corn symbol here, rice, this little corn symbol here, or this little rice symbol here, and then wheat, which I don't think I see a wheat on the map, but wheat is another one of those farming resources. And I think there's a, there might be another one, I could be wrong. Um, but I would generally say that the, the watermill is slightly more expensive and slightly better because it provides production. But the granary is great for growth because it gives you housing. But I, you know, watermill granary if the city is at like one population is a pretty good way to go about things. That plus one production might not sound like much, but imagine if you were able to have a citizen working a two food, one production tile for the rest of the game after you build a watermill. That's the way that I want you to think about the watermill. Um, that's almost what it works. It's like, it's like as if you had an extra citizen in the city working a, a one food, one production tile, which for 80 production seems like a pretty good return on investment, in my opinion. Um, now, we are going to go for the... Yeah, we want to go for horseback riding. I think that's our goal. We did get our three slingers so we could do our boosts. Um, this city has not yet grown to the horses, which is like mildly annoying. Bang. Actually, it did grow to the horses. There's horseback riding boosted, which is worth one era score. We're now generating horse resources. We can sell those to the AI if we want. We will be keeping them for our own horseman production. I would like to build a encampment, if at all possible. My scouts up here in the north, I'm going to go ahead and take faster movement in hills. Um, just because there's more hills in the nearby area, that's usually just how I, I judge it. It's like, which which decision will benefit me like in the immediate future? Um, it's typically how I make my decisions. We could take suzerainty of Rapa Nui, which would give me access to the Moai improvement, which is quite a good improvement. More importantly, having suzerainty of Rapa Nui would also get me plus one diplomatic favor that I can sell to the AI and give me their vision. And they might have vision of things that I don't have vision of. I'll also get plus two error score for being the first person to suzerain them. And potentially I could levy their military for use against Norway as well. So there's a whole bunch of reasons. Also having access to Rapa Nui kind of gives me a little bit of control over this southeast sector plus the pathway between me and Stockholm. So it's a whole bunch of reasons that you want to do that. Um, I've got a spare bill charger. I'm going to walk him into the capital, chop this woods and then come back to uh, maybe do the horses. Let's kill him. Perfect. We will move you there. And we have got a government plaza just cranked out there. Let's go and let's go and Think about what we want to do. Do we actually want to go for a domination game? Um, so the government plaza is an important building because it gives you access to not only governor titles, which we did just get a governor title, by the way, on Magnus. It gives you access to the government plaza buildings, and these have really significant empire-wide effects. So, for example, the Ancestral Hall gives you a 50% production boost towards settlers in this city, so just this city, but new cities will also receive a free builder. Then you've got the Audience Chamber, which gives you plus two amenities and plus four housing in cities with governors, but minus two loyalty in cities without governors. And then you've got the Warlord's Throne, which gives you a 20% production boost in all cities for five turns when you capture an enemy city. So this could be a really good way for us to boost ourselves up. We don't need to make this decision now. I do plan on settling a few extra cities. I kind of plan on attacking someone too. Audience Chamber, the only one here that I would say is bad for us is if we go for Audience Chamber, it'll be harder to maintain loyalty when we actually go to war. But generally, all of these are relatively good choices. Free builders are useful but I don't think we need to make this choice right now. What we could do is stop off for pyramids. And if I was able to get this tile right here in the capital, it would be amazing, but it's 110 gold. However, there is a trick here. Rather than paying 110 gold, this tile is one, two, three tiles away from the capital, right? You start at the capital tile, you step once, you step twice, you step thrice. So that means I'm going to pay the maximum price for this tile. However, if I go to the city of Ravenna, I can buy this exact same tile for 75 gold, then immediately go back to Rome and swap it. And now I've managed to buy that tile for a 35 gold discount, which is truly, truly amazing. Isn't that wonderful? And because I have Magnus established in this city, I can just come in here, chop the woods, take four turns off that wonder and be in like a brilliant position.
to get the pyramid. Now, why the hell do I want to build the pyramid? Well, the pyramid is really good because A, it gives you plus two culture, right? Plus two culture, it's like an extra monument. Now, it's a monument that you pay four times more for. But here's the really big thing. You get a free builder back and builders cost 62 production. So I get a monument, which is like 60 production and a builder, which is like 62 production. So I'm getting 120 production back immediately the second I finish the pyramids. But the really key thing here is that all builders can build one extra improvement. Now, the cost of builders is increased every time you build a builder. So if you have to improve um, 300 tiles and your builders have three build charges, you need to build 100 builders. And so the price of your builders are going to go up 100 times. If you have to build 300 tiles and your builders have four build charges, right, which they will with pyramids, you only have to build 75 builders, which means you will improve that territory faster because you'll get more build charges out uh, per turn and cheaper because you'll spend less for those build charges. So not only will you benefit faster from those tiles, it'll also cost you less to invest in those tiles. And you have to really think about civilization as a game where you're trying to minimize the amount you input to something and maximize the amount you're getting out. So imagine if you put in 100 gold, you want to get 200 gold out. If you're putting in 100 gold and you're getting 100 gold out, that's not a good transaction. That's why these two food tiles aren't good to work. Because if you're working a two food tile, you're spending it one citizen slot, right? to food to get to food. And so your goal is to maximize that engine to get the best return on your investment as possible. And things like the pyramids are absolutely gonna be the thing that helps you do that. Now, I got my little bit of a trade route here and I wanna talk a little bit about what trade routes do for you and how you should use them. So I want you to think of trade routes as two things. There are trade routes that you send to your own cities and there are trade routes that you send to other empires. Trade routes that you send to your own cities I want you to think of these as like population that you can move around your empire. Okay, that's what I really want you to think about this. So like if I send a trade route to my own city, Rome, I will get two food and two production in the city of Aretium. Now that is two food and two production is quite a bit. That is a 33% increase in the current production of the city. It is a 25% increase in the current food of the city. It's actually a 50% growth increase because the, the city only has uh, plus four food per turn compared to its other stuff. So I want you to really think about that, okay? What you could do with a trader for your internal trade routes is move a population around your town. Now, I also want to talk about how the yields of a trade route are calculated, particularly when it comes to internal trade routes. Every single district in the game, um, with the exception of the preserve, which is funny because it's the one that I right clicked on, every single district in the game that is a specialty district has what is called a trade yield. That means if you're sending a trade route to a city that has this district, you will get some bonus. Domestic destinations, i.e. sending trade routes from your empire to your empire, will get plus one production when it comes to the encampment. International destinations, i.e. sending a trade route from your empire to another empire or another empire sending one to you, will get plus one production as well. The campus is quite interesting because it gives plus one food on internal or domestic trade routes, but plus one science on external trade routes. So trading with someone that has campuses can actually be a good way to get a small bump of science in the early game. So something that you should be considering. Now, how we want to use this trade route is to maybe try to build up some of our cities a little bit quicker. So for example, if we think the city of Aretium is really key and we need to get a particular building online, we could set up a trade route going to the capital to build that up. If we taught the city of Ravenna is really, really important to get up and running, we could put the trade route here. Alternatively, the other way that you can use trade routes is to send them to other players. Now there's, when I say other players, to send them externally. And there's two ways you can send, well, there's, there's three main ways you can send trade routes externally. You can send them to city-states to generate envoys. If the city-state has a quest, you can send them there just to fulfill the quest. You can send them externally for gold, or you can send them to allies to benefit from special yields that you get when you become someone's ally. Right now, I think the best use of this, because of Rome's ability at plus one gold, is to send it internally. Two food, two production, two the capital is amazing. The really, really unique thing, by the way, about the government plaza is this, unlike most districts in the game that add one production or one um, food to internal trade routes, government plazas and diplomatic encampments, part of the diplomatic, uh, I forget the name of it, diplomatic quarters, they provide plus one food and plus one production to internal trade routes sent to that city, which is really, really powerful. I think the city of Aretium is a little bit on like the bad loyalty side of things. So I'm going to go ahead and send that trade route to Rome to get that two food, two production and one gold. That will also boost the, the knowledge of currency, getting me another error score. Because remember, I am in the free inquiry 
age. And, and don't worry about trying to remember all this stuff. As you play the game, you're going to forget things and then you'll run into them again. And you go, oh yeah, that's how that works. And your brain will slowly over time forge the connections between those pieces of data. So I would super not sweat it. Now, I have a couple of options that I could go for with Eretium. If I wanted to go hard on science, I could. If I wanted to get an encampment to go for militaristic stuff, which kind of appeals to me. And I kind of like, it's kind of romantic, not romantic, uh, but it's kind of like, it feels right to me to put an encampment in between a whole bunch of horses. Like that feels like a fun, like this is like, of course, this is where we train the horses. So we build like the military encampment near the horses, right? That just feels right to me. I do feel like encampments should culture bomb neutral tiles. I just feel like that's something they should do because you're effectively building like a fortress. Like this should be, especially, ooh, that would be a really cool extra Roman ability is like encampments, culture bomb neutral tiles to sort of reference the idea that they would build forts out, you know, in, um, in, in like, quote unquote, uncivilized land. Although, you know, that's kind of like, they were colonizers, like really. Uh, let's go ahead and build a mine here. Boom. Pretty much every successful empire in history, I'm pretty sure was just like some some form of colonizers. Like, hey, this land is empty. And the people who are there are just like, uh, we're here. And they're like, I think you, I think you heard me say this land is empty, by the way. <laughs> uh, or like, did I stutter? <laughs> uh, right, so we have the pyramids coming. I would like to get those horses. That's fine. We have an extra governor title. I don't think we're going to be doing any more chopping in the capital. So I'm going to move Magnus to Aquileia. I'm going to grab Magnus, reassign him to Aquileia, this city. Then I'm going to go ahead and grab Pingala. Pingala is a fantastic, fantastic leader because he has the special bonuses of giving you 15% increase in science and culture generated by the city, as well as plus one culture and plus one science per turn for each citizen in the city, which means if you grow a really big city, you can get a ton of science and culture. Now, it does take five turns for him to establish in a city when he's placed in it, so it'll be a little bit of a while before we actually start to benefit from that, but this is a great way to carry yourself through the early game. Uh, Pingala is just one of those S-tier picks. You should absolutely be going for him. Okay, there's games and recreation. We can now get started on the Colosseum. We don't really need to get the Colosseum going super quickly. The AI doesn't like hardcore push for it. I will go for defensive tactics because feudalism is one of the most important civics in the entire game because it gives you access to the plus two build charges on, on builders. Combined with the pyramids, this doubles the efficiency of our builders, which means we're able to not only develop our land twice as quickly, we're able to pay half as much incremental cost so super super important that you you go for feudalism feudalism is honestly i would imagine there's basically like two phases of there's like three phases of the game there's the pre-feudalism phase the post-feudalism phase and the post-feudalism phase lasts all the way up until you get your tier three government and then the tier three government phase is when you go for your win condition Typically, that is like how a typical game will flow. Fascism, if you're going to war, communism, if you're going for science, unless you're going for a democratic science, democracy, if you're going for culture, um, you can do a communist culture. I wouldn't recommend it. I think democracy, democracy is just better in most scenarios for culture games. At least that would be my opinion. Um, there's a nice horseman there hiding in the fog of war, causing me some issues. Uh, and your scouting objectives here, if you get tired of micromanaging your scouts, you can put them on auto explore, but you really do just have to make peace with the fact that they're going to get themselves killed in the fog of war. If you manage them directly, the probability of that is not zero, uh, but it's a hell of a lot better than what it is if they ma micromanage themselves. So I'm going to come in here and I would like to change my policies. I'm going to unlock my policies and plug in the maneuver card because I just unlocked horsemen. Now the maneuver card will give me a 50% production boost towards ancient and classical era heavy and light cavalry units. The horseman is a classical era light cavalry unit and we would like to start pre-building some of them. Now we do have to wait for a couple more turns to get those horses in store, but we're not in a we're not in a major rush to get that done. Let's get to work on currency because it would be nice to get commercial hubs. We will need gold to fuel our armies. That's going to be really useful. And I, I do just want to like I I want to make sure that I clarify this is being played on Prince difficulty. So this is really aimed at people who are just like completely new to save. I'm not doing any of like the hyper super efficient strategies. I'm just trying to play a game where I where I stay on par with the AI. You can see here, I've got 11 science. She's got 11 science. I've got 15 culture. He's got 14 culture. I'm trying to stay on par with the AI, which should be your goal as a new player is like, I just don't want to fall behind the Prince level AI because the Prince level AI has no extra bonuses to their yields. There's plus two error score for reaching a 10 population city in our capital. That'll be really great when we get Pingala going in there. We're going for defensive tactics. That's totally fine. Unit needs orders. We'll pop in over here. Unit needs orders. Um, this guy is doing what we call fog busting. He's making sure no things spawn over here. 
And we're, we're going to have a few turns of quietness. There's not going to be much happening. In all honesty, the Hanging Gardens has been built by another player. This scout is now in danger, so I'm going to retreat him. We did get the Granary in Ravenna. And getting the Granary has given us a uh, plus two housing, which allows us to grow up to four population without any housing penalties. If you are one population away from your housing limit, you will take a 50% growth penalty, which means after you eat food, any excess food that you have will be halved. And then I think if you're two population over your housing limit, you just don't grow anymore. I could be wrong. Or maybe it's a 75% penalty. I don't remember how the food scaling thing works, um, but I just know that it's annoying and prob problematic, like for trying to make a really good save. Um, so the city of Ravenna has finished building the granary. And what this city really needs, if I look at it, it's got a lot of really what I would consider to be low quality tiles. So it really needs a builder. Now in a perfect world, a builder would come from another city, but unfortunately, I just don't have the resources to be able to send a builder from another city. So Ravenna is gonna have to hard build its own builder. Um, one thing I could also do is get started on a horseman because Ravenna isn't a particularly important city. And if it starts a horseman, I can send that from a different city later. So I'm gonna start the production of a horseman in there with the goal of just eventually getting it. I'm going to leave that horseman one turn from finishing because if you finish a horseman, he does cost two gold per turn to actually pay. And you don't actually want to be paying for the horseman. You want the horseman to pop out exactly when you need him in a perfect scenario. Okay, perfect. There is the market. We have access to the commercial hub. We are going to be getting ourselves commercial hubs. You could make an argument of rushing apprenticeship if you have a decent number of mines in your empire. We only have three mines. So that is worth three production because apprenticeship is a very important technology. It's a bit like the feudalism of the, the science tree because it gives you that plus one production per mine. That is a big deal. However, we all you do have to keep in mind that does unlock man at arms, which permanently locks you out of the legion. So do keep that in mind. Um, one thing that you can do is very quickly just backfill for any text from the previous era. This can be useful to do. You don't necessarily have to do this. It can be useful to beeline things. Um, I think it would be nice to go in the direction of engineering to get a couple of catapults to support our cavalry. Siege units are very useful in taking down cities because they don't suffer any attack penalties against city walls. Whereas most ranged units in the games, like crossbowmen, archers, all of those guys, they get a penalty when attacking walls. 95.8 or 99.9999999999% of the time, the thing that you want to go for here is the encampment. You want to get yourself a stable, um, or sorry, the thing you want to go for in the encampment is a stable, and that's because the stable provides a 25% combat experience boost for all cavalry and siege class units trained in the city. Um, and cavalry and siege are the most powerful units in the game for two really key reasons. The first one being, um, cavalry are just faster than melee units. You can see here, warriors have a movement of two. Heavy chariots have a movement of two. They do get three on flat terrain. And horsemen have a movement of four. Okay, so the big advantage of cavalry is that they just move faster. The big advantage of catapults is that they can still do good damage to units, but they take no penalty when attacking cities. And if you get them early and level them up, they can outrange cities and take them down for free at a distance. Whereas archers will always be shot by cities. They have really low melee defensive strengths and they will never effectively deal damage to anything other than units. You can kind of spec archers to be anti-city, but it's, it's really only super early in the game before any cities have walls. The second that crossbowmen come out, it's, you're going to have a really bad time. So archers are your siege units before you can actually build siege units. But once you have the capability of even researching siege units, you should really start considering transitioning. And basically for the rest of the game, we're going to be using light cavalry in the ancient era, or light cavalry in the medieval era, heavy cavalry from literally onwards. So there's a brief window in the medieval and early renaissance with, sorry, in the classical and medieval era, with horsemen and coursers where, where horsemen are viable. The second that you have knights, heavy cavalry are just better because knights are just so much better. Um, but I would go as far as to say because chariots only have two moves, three, if they're on a flat tile, horsemen are better. And that stays true up to coursers, um, which is like late medieval, early renaissance, or yeah, late medieval, early renaissance. And so if you, if you already went for light cavalry, you can extend their usefulness by going for courses, but you should almost always just go for knights because knights are better, which means one of your primary motivators should be to secure a source of iron in the early game if you want to do anything militaristic or towards the end of the medieval era. So we have finished the pyramids. We got our free builder. That's a huge moment for us. We're going to send that free builder down to Aquilia. And the goal with sending him down there is to use these chops 
to get out settlers. Okay, so with the pyramids in Rome, I do think that it makes sense for us to go for the warlord's throne this game. I'm going to at least conquer my island, um, my whole island, just to kind of show off how you, you kill neighbors in the early game. So this will give me a 20% production boost in all of my cities. This scales really nicely if I'm winning wars. It'll take about 11 turns to build, which is totally fine. That's not a problem for us. There's defensive tactics, and we are going to choose a civic here. We are naturally going for feudalism to get those builder charges. So we'll go for that first. This is like super key. You have, you basically have to rush this, in my opinion. You basically have to rush feudalism. It's that important. It's so incredibly important for your game plan. We did just get another governor title and it's 99.9% .9 of the time you are going to want to get connoisseur first on Pingala because in the early game, culture is more important for science when it comes to militaristic things. And the reason for that is culture is how you get more governor titles. So by promoting Pingala, if I come over to the city of Rome and then I assign a worker, you can see here, I'm now generating plus 13 culture from population. I'm getting three culture because every pop uh, produces 0.3 culture on its own. And then another plus one per population from Pingala compared to my eight science. And then I can use that culture to get more governor titles. Like I could go for recorded history nice and quick here. And then I can pop the other governor title into Pingala to get plus one science per turn for each citizen in the city. So you go, it's just the, the culture, it's more optimal. If there's a science tech you really need to work, it can't, you, there are scenarios we're going for the science route first. Maybe you need to unlock a key unit to defend yourself, you know, but that's something you're going to develop with a little bit of game knowledge. I would say 99.9% .9 of the time, if you invest in culture before science, you're going to do better. That's why the, and you have to remember, especially in a game where you're not really planning to build theater squares, getting that little bit of, um, getting that little bit of culture per turn actually carries you because our science is going to increase quite rapidly in comparison to our culture. So by getting that culture up nice and early, we can give us the space to allow that transition to happen. Okay, I think I would like to chop this jungle tile and maybe put an encampment on it. And I would like to get two encampments because I want to be able to get great generals with a little bit of haste. Um, so I think building two encampments feels quite good for me to be able to get great generals. Uh, and the reason that you want to go for great generals, particularly if you're going for a war game, is great generals provide you with combat strength and movement speed. So we're going to go ahead and chop that tile. And I got a 50% bonus to the yields because Magnus is established in the city. And then we're going to... Actually, we're going to start training horsemen. I'm going to come to Ravenna. I'm going to cancel that horseman because there's one turn left. And then I'm going to tell the city, you need... No. I've changed my mind. I'm going for the I'm going for the settler in here and you need to squeeze me out a builder slowly because I I just this this should line up with us getting access to feudalism. It should be it should be pretty close. I'm going to stand my scout on this tile right here and the reason I'm going to stand him here is because if I go into the settler map mode, this is the only tile in the local area that a tile could be settled near my empire. So I'd like to prevent the AI from settling on that tile. So by parking a unit there, I basically, quote unquote, claim it for my empire. When it comes to chopping, I am going to just chop out a whole bunch of settlers here. This city's going to have really bad production after I'm finished with it, but that's honestly fine. It's worth it sometimes to make a city have bad production if it gives you really fast, really fast settling speed. Um, so like if I chop this, boom, six turns on a settler now. And there are always tiles that are available in here that we could maybe make some production off of. I might leave these two lumber mills. And speaking of lumber mills, I should totally unlock construction to get those because without lumber mills, I think the city, I think I need to have at least these two lumber mills to make the city useful. I want, I wanted to chop everything, but I don't think it makes sense, but I definitely can chop out a settler here. Boom. And we'll send that settler up here to claim this tile. Okay, there's recorded history, which got us our second promotion that we can feed into Bengala to get researcher. That's plus one science per turn. Now, if we build six farms, feudalism will get boosted. We don't plan on building six farms, but we want that plus two build charges here. Um, so we're going to go for that. Do I want to go for another settler in here? I don't think I do. I think I would rather go for the encampment and start building that up. Um, yeah, and then I'll start a horseman in Eretium. We finished the stable in Eretium. Let's go ahead and grab that horseman. Now this city can can produce horsemen in three turns. Okay, that's a crazy fast speed to build horses. Now another option we could do is to run some projects to get the great general faster. That's not super important to me, so I'm not going to bother with that. I will go for the pasture here because that's plus one production. Not bad. Yeah. Okay. Warlord's throne 
is finished, which got us another governor title. This one we can put on to Victor. And the reason that we want to go for Victor is because Victor establishes in three turns. He increases the garrison strength of a city by five, making it harder to attack the city. He has access to garrison commander and defense logistics. Both give you access to better defensive stuff and also embrasure. You can use him when you promote him a couple of times to actually produce units that start with a promotion, which is very useful because then you can attack and then immediately promote the next turn. Basically, promotions act like a health potion on your units so you can you can have a full health unit with a promotion that can take some damage and immediately promote um, which is really really annoying to deal with i do like the idea of going for the edamananki i'm going to go for it this game just because i have a decent floodplain that would be really fun to do it um, and remember the key thing that you want to be doing in civ is have fun if you're ahead technologically like i am right now you don't need to build you don't need to keep getting more ahead. Have some fun with it, man. Build some horses, kill some people, you know, live a little. I would like to build the Terracotta army. That's really cool, but the city doesn't quite have the production for it. I'm going to work one single encampment training so that we can save up some more horses. And the reason that you do encampment trainings is so that you can get your great general faster. And I think maybe three to four horses should be enough to kill Norway uh, pretty easily, I feel. Oh, wow, that's a lot of stuff. Um, let's get to work on apprenticeship. Like I said, it is the feudalism of the tech tree. It's important for us to get it. And it's funny that I'm saying it's the feudalism of the tech tree because we're getting both around the same time. Right, horsemen, let's head them north. Get them into position. You can also use these military units to scout a little bit. It's like, oh, do I want... I want to, like, look at what his military is. They might get a little bit annoyed at you for putting units on their border, but, like, whatever, man. Let's go ahead and settle my settler right here. This will effectively control the north for me, kind of cutting off... Uh, Genghis Khan. Now we could attack Genghis, Genghis Khan. I don't think we need to. Oh, this builder finished way sooner than I had planned. That's okay. He's still a four charge builder. Let's go ahead and improve the salt. Now here's the thing. Is that my second copy of salt? It is not. So we just got an extra amenity for my empire. This will be my second copy of silver. Luxury resources that are resource tiles with the kind of purplish background. You'll learn what they are over time, but they're really, really important to get online because a really important thing that you can do with luxuries is you can sell them to other players for money. So if I come over here to Sweden and I'm like, hey, you want to give me like a whole bunch of money? She'll give me 90 gold right now and five gold per turn for 30 turns, which is an insane amount of cash. That's an insane amount. So luxury is super important to sell those to the AI. Keep that in mind. Don't sleep on the power of luxuries for generating revenue for your empire. That's why scouting is really important so that you can find other civilizations. You can sell them your goods and wares and use that goods and wares to turn around and kill them. Thus begins the cycle of life. In this city, I'm going to build ancient walls purely because it's on the border with Mongolia. Um, I feel like it would be a good move to build walls if you've got a border with Mongolia. I can't think of a single historical reason that that would be true, but it just feels, you know, emotionally like the right thing to be doing. Oh yeah, there, there was that whole time that Mongolia like invaded the world. So, you know, there was that. That might be what's giving me that overwhelming feel, feeling of dread. It could be, it could be that. It could be. Now, this trade route has finished, so it no longer is needed here in Eretium. One amazing thing that you can do with your trade routes, okay? Put them in a brand new city. Imagine if you plonked down a brand new city and you could double the speed that it develops. That is what a trader does for you. It literally, if you're sending a trader to an effective trade route to a good city, you will literally double the rate at which the city comes online. And when a city, what I mean by when a city comes online is it's producing era appropriate material in about 15 to 20 turns. Right, that, that, is the, that is like the ballpark. If you're in the medieval era and you're producing a medieval era thing in like 15 to 20 turns, you're like on pace for that era. Faster than that, you're doing amazing. Now that does change when you start playing on the higher difficulties. It's more like <laughs> eight turns um, and any slower than that and you're dead. But still, listen, you're not ready for this. This is a complete beginner's tutorial. So yeah, just use these trade routes. Like they're like they're like workers you can move around this your empire to, to help improve the city. Like I literally just shaved. This was a 22 turn ancient wall. Now it's a 14 turn ancient wall. This was a four turn grow time. Now it's a four turn grow time. Sorry, now it's a two turn grow time. It quite literally doubles the effective rate of growth because now when this city grows another population faster, it'll grow the next population faster and it'll build the building faster. So by adding just this one extra trader here, 
this city has like plus one population and is now on a much more accelerated curve. I wish I wish it was like a really good way for me to show that. I might I might do some like city simulations. Ooh, that would be a kind of a cool video idea. If I simulated if I created like scenarios that I found in my games and like simulated whether or not I put a trader in that city. And like how important is it to get a trader in a city that's developing? And I could really show off just how much it changes the growth curve of that city. Okay, we did just finish unlocking feudalism, which will give us error score, which is fantastic. The second that you unlock feudalism, you want to plug in the serfdom card and start building builders basically everywhere to the point where like you probably shouldn't even be making settlers because the second that you have feudalism and apprenticeship, improving hill tiles just becomes so incredibly profitable. It's kind of insane, actually. So that's going to be one of our key things is to try to get builders out. I will go for another horseman in Eretium. We are very close to getting a great general, which is exciting. And then you want to come back and you want to start getting things like military training because it gives you access to the statue of, Ju of Zeus. Um, the statue of Juice. <laughs> I almost said the statue of Juice. <laughs> How could you make a statue out of Juice? <laughs> There's plus two era score for getting the first technology from the medieval era. And now we have access to apprenticeship. This will give us plus one production on all of our mines. We can also build industrial zones. Industrial zones aren't a super important building, but they can be useful. We're going to be getting Edamanaki. And notice how I haven't even settled that much, that many cities. There's a ton of land. I could fit like three or four cities over here on the left, but I don't need to. I'm ahead of the AI. By the way, if you're a relatively new player and you need to know how to turn on this panel, you just come up here, you go to options, you go to interface, show yields in HUD ribbon, click set it to always show and you can always tell if you're doing well compared to the AI. On higher difficulties, the first 100 to 150 turns, you're going to be behind the AI. Don't worry about that. That's normal. On lower difficulties, you should be ahead of the AI 95% of the time if you're playing correctly. Now, we can go for knights right now, but that's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to start the to research catapults, because I would like to get some catapults. I'm going to go ahead and recruit that great general. This great general will give plus one movement and plus five combat strength to these units. Now, plus five combat strength might not sound like a very big bonus, but plus five is like a game changer because the way that the combat strength calculators work is that if you have 10 more combat strength than the unit that you're attacking, you do 50% more damage than you take. So let's say we had a horseman who had a plus 10 combat strength over a warrior. Let's just say hypothetically, if you attack that warrior, you might take 20 damage and do 30. Okay, so that's really, really important. The second really key breakpoint is if you are 30, it's 30 or 31 or maybe 32. It's, it's about 30 combat strength above your enemy's combat strength. You will kill them in one shot. And that is similarly true for 20%. If you're 20 combat strength ahead of your enemy, I think you kill them in two shots. I have to double check all that, but it's something to that effect. Um, and that's from full health. So getting extra combat strength makes your army just insanely efficient. It's actually such an important game concept that I really do have to stress just how important it is. I'm going to grab Magnus. I'm going to reassign Magnus to Ravenna because there's actually quite a few chops over here. And the good thing about the chops in this city is that a lot of these tiles are actually hills so they can be improved with mines after you chop them. Because by chopping a tile, you actually lower its quality, but you get a nice benefit as a reward. And I would generally say lowering the quality of a tile to get a benefit right now is a worthwhile thing to do most of the time. It's almost co always correct to be chopping tiles. So we did just finish researching recorded history. We're going to go for civil service next because getting an alliance could be pretty useful. Um, we would maybe like to go for divine right. This would allow us to produce knights faster. So I think I am going to head towards monarchy because I want that chivalry card. Chivalry being a card that gives us a 50% production boost towards industrial era and earlier heavy and cavalry light units. The knight being a uh, medieval era heavy cavalry unit is boosted by that card whereas the and so is the courser so if we want to keep producing cavalry we kind of need that card i've got two envoys in the bank i'm going to just put a single envoy into kakwana but before i do that i'm going to come in here i'm going to plug out 
charismatic leader and then I'm going to plug in diplomatic league. I'm going to confirm my policies and then by doing that when I put an envoy into Caguana now it'll actually count as two envoys which is fantastic. So I've effectively doubled the amount of envoys that I got from that expenditure which is really useful and then I can swap that card back and continue getting more envoy influence points. So swapping your cards in and out it's a really important skill for you to develop. If you're a relatively new player you can get away with not doing it but I'm just trying to teach you everything that you could possibly learn that would make you a better player at Civ because that is what I'm hoping you're watching this series for. You're I'm ho you're hoping to watch this series to learn like what should I be doing in each era? What is like my benchmark? And I'm actually like purposefully playing the game slightly badly right now. And the reason I'm doing that is because I want to demonstrate that you don't have to play perfectly to have fun. And I'm trying to set a benchmark for Prince play. This is what I would consider to be like Prince play benchmark. Like one of the AIs might be a little bit ahead of you technologically and scientifically, but all the rest of the AIs should be like a little bit behind you. And you should have a relatively good military score and you should be considering going to war. One of the big things that you should get used to is understanding that 4X games like Civilizations fundamentally are war games. This is something I fought for a very long time. But if you embrace the war and learn how to fight it effectively, um, it actually becomes a really fun, rewarding part of the gameplay. So I, for a long time, considered myself a pacifist player. Um, but I've started to recently embrace the bloodthirst. Now, we have two encampments. You typically, you probably don't need that many encampments, but gold is the sign of nobility. So we could justify going for a commercial hub. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start producing a horseman so that we can have a really big army. I think around about now, it could be a good time to declare war. We have catapults coming. We have horses coming. We have an encampment finishing. We're about to finish the Edamananki to get our signs up. We're just like in a fairly good spot militarily to declare war. Now, you could make the justification that I should wait for another one or two horses. And that's a totally reasonable thing to decide. We did just finish the Edamananki, giving us really nice science yields on these tiles. You can see that. It's a uh, plus one, I think, what is it? Plus one production and plus one science from the Edamananki on these. And then plus two science and plus one production on marshes. So that little bit of science means we don't, we can get away with not building, um, not building campuses for a while, which means my capital can work on catapults. You know, that's useful. Um, really, it should get builders. I should squeeze out a builder in here, but I also need the catapult really soon. And it's tempting to always go for the, for the economic play because what a lot of people think they do, they think, oh, I make the line go up. Sometimes building military units is making the line go up because the earlier that you have a military unit, the sooner that you can declare war, the sooner that you can declare war, the sooner you can conquer new lands, the sooner you can conquer new lands, the sooner you can start profiting from those new lands, yada, 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 so on and so forth. So it is an important concept, um, in my opinion, but don't lose sight of the forest for the trees. Do make sure that you're doing responsible economic management. Don't just grow your economy to grow your economy to grow your economy. You want to grow your economy for a purpose. We did just unlock iron working, giving us access to the Legion. Unfortunately, we haven't actually found iron, but um, if we did have a desert hill somewhere, we could build the Jebel Barkal and potentially get iron from that. It's not a very viable or useful thing for us in this particular game because we already have horses that we're preparing to attack with. Uh, we have catapults coming right now. I'm going to place a lumber mill in the city of Quileia because I want the city to have good production. It did just finish the encampment. I'm going to go for the stable as well in here. Again, I want the plus one great general points per turn. I want that passive great general generation. Um, and the 25% combat experience for all cavalry and siege class units is also super useful over the long, 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 long course of the game. I'm going to go ahead and unlock mathematics because I want access to my diplomatic quarter. The diplomatic quarter is a very useful building, so I would like it sooner rather than later. And we will continue to develop our empire. We're, I'd say we're just about ready to go to war, but it's going to be an awkward, weird fight. So let's go ahead and denounce Norway. Now, the reason that we denounce Norway is because if we just declared a normal war, if we just declared a surprise war, not only will we take 150 grievances, right? Any further grievances that we earned from the war would be increased by 150%. This would make other players not like it as much. This would make it harder to hold his cities with loyalty. It just has a bunch of negative effects. So my recommendation is denounce first, wait five turns, and then declare your war. It does require a little bit of setup, a little bit of preparation, but it can be worth it. But effectively, I'm committing to going to war here by setting that denounce button. There are reasons you might not want to click the denounce button. It can be worth it to not, because 
the little bit of diplomatic flexibility could lead to you being in a better position. I'm going to go ahead and plug out the diplomatic league card. I'm going to plug in the charismatic leader card, which will give me again plus two influence towards envoys, effectively increasing the rate at which I earn envoys by 60%. I'm going to confirm my policies. And I've got two envoys. However, placing these envoys would not change the board state. This is a really important concept when it comes to envoy management. You only imagine if you had money. I want you to imagine that you had a money and you could buy for every five dollars you put into a pot, you get a Ferrari. If you have four dollars and you put that into the pot, you don't get a Ferrari. So why would you put your $4 into the pot? You want to wait until you have $5 because then you get the reward. So you're better off just keeping those $4 in your pocket, right? There's no need, there's no reason to spend them because maybe another thing will open up that says, hey, if you put $4 in, I'll give you $5. And now you've just got a Ferrari, right? And that's the analogy I want to use here when I'm talking about envoys. Your envoys are an incredibly important, incredibly rare, one of the most limited empire-wide infrastructures in the entire game. Do not spend them for no reason. Save them, save them, okay? Only ever spend them if it changes the board state. So like, for example, if I had a whole bunch of banks, shipyards and consulates, it would make sense to put an envoy into Hunza to get that bonus. I literally will not benefit from any of these because I don't have my consulate building yet. Once I do have my consulate, like right now, my threshold for city states is one to two envoys or suzerainty, okay? So I either want to have one to two envoys in a city state or I want to be suzerain of them. Those are the th two, two board state changes that I want to look for. The second that I build my diplomatic quarter and then I build my consulate, then it becomes I want to have three envoys in because I'll get four gold in my consulate or I want to be suzerain. And then when I get to the late game, when I'm building my late game buildings like the chancery, that's when I go, okay, I want to have six envoys or be suzerain. So I can't become suzerain by spending envoys right now because I need seven to become suzerain. So I'm just not going to spend any because it would be pointless. And I hope that kind of explains. Like, I, I, I often get asked, like, why aren't you spending your envoy points? And that is the, like, 99.9% .9 of the time. I know I've said that phrase a few times, but it, it's, it's, it's just, it's true. It's just in the vast majority of cases, spending those envoys won't change the state of the game. Okay, let's go ahead and get our very first. I think what we're going to do here, actually, I've changed my mind. I'm going to chop out a settler. These chops are incredibly rare, um, but I'm going to wait until I can plug in the settler card. So I may as well finish that catapult or as close to finish as I can. Chops are quite rare. And in a game where I'm kind of crunched for production like this, chopping out settlers is a really effective use of Magnus and forest chops. Now, we did finish the ancient walls in Mediolanum, so I'm feeling relatively safe from the north. I do think it makes sense for me to go granary watermill in here. Um, this is a very default basic way to play. Just go for granaries, watermills, builders. I would even maybe go builder first, maybe like granary builder, builder granary, something like that. I think because if we think about how do we advance the economy of this city? Well, one of the ways to advance the economy of this city is to improve the tiles that it's working. Another way to advance the economy of this city is to increase the number of tiles that it can work by increasing the amount of housing that it has, i.e. builders and granaries. Another way we could advance the economy is by building districts. This would be what I would recommend you focus on when you get better at the game. But until then, just faff about, man. As long as you're not falling behind the AI, just kind of screw around, build wonders, have a good time. Don't sweat it, okay? It's not your job to be sweaty, okay? That's my job, especially if I'm hanging out with your mom. Woo, yeah. So there is theology. We have unlocked theology. I'm going to come in here. I'm going to go ahead and drop urban planning. I'm going to plug in colonization for the 50% production towards settlers. I'm going to confirm. I'm going to come here. I'm going to switch away from the catapult to the settler and I'm going to chop for 99 production, getting me that settler in four turns. I then I'm going to switch back to the catapult because I can one turn that catapult and then go immediately go back to working the settler. Makes sense? I hope it makes sense. Okay. Uh, we got another envoy. We can't change the board state, so there's no point spending them. Our first two catapults are coming out. How long until we can declare a formal war? One more turn. So it's actually two more end turns is how that works because it's technically five of Norway's turns. And because he goes after me, Oh, no, it actually is. Oh, usually it says zero turns until you can declare a formal war. Let's go ahead and declare that formal war right now. So I'm going to take 50% initial less grievances and 50% less ongoing grievances for doing things to him. Now, one of the key, key things that you want to be doing when you declare war is you want to be looking for what I call our low hanging fruit victories. Okay, low hanging fruit victories, things like stealing settlers, things like pillaging districts. Things like pillaging tiles, getting money, getting science, getting culture. You want to look for ways that you can effectively turn your army 
into economy, because that is the point of building an army in civilization. Um, if you imagine everything in civilization is to do with building an economy, it's to, to get more science, more culture, more faith, more gold, more tourism, more diplomatic favor, more envoys, more... Sp it's more, 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 okay? That is what I want you to be thinking the entire time that you're playing civilization. And that is why it's really, really important. When you're building an army, you are getting resources in one of two ways. You're building an army defensively, which is preventing someone else from taking your resources from you. Or you're building an army offensively, which is allowing you to take resources from somebody else. Those are the two roles of an army. And it's really important that you master that concept. A defensive army can be much smaller than a offensive army, but a lot of people don't know how to get value from war. And one of the best ways to get value from war is to pillage tiles, particularly campuses, particularly mines, particularly districts. Um, don't bother pillaging farms. You don't get much from it. Another way to get value from war is obviously conquering cities. That's another way to get that value. But seriously, just I want you to focus on that concept. How do I get value from war. I don't want you to think of your military as a military. I want you to think of it as an economic. I want you to think of it as an economic thing. It's it's a way to either preserve or expand your economy. That is the two roles of an army. Okay? And that's probably somewhat even true like today, right? In in, in IRL terms. Now, taking a look at the city of Aretium, I would say that this city has built enough military, has built enough infrastructure, so we can start to maybe look into expanding to the left. So I'm going to come in here, I'm going to get started on a settler because this city has relatively good production, so it can produce a settler in 11 turns. And that will get me set up for settling over here in this kind of weird land. Let's pop down another mine. And I really, really want to emphasize that normally, like, getting the apprenticeship thing for plus one in production to mine improvements is literally like a 50% increase in the production you get from these grassland hills. It is insanely, insanely useful. It increases the profit rate of these tiles by so goddamn much. Really, really important. So Rapa Nui, I don't believe it. Rapa Nui just stole <laughs> Norway's settler, so I don't get my free settler now. I'm a little bit annoyed by that. I'm, I'm going to be real. Um, but look, that is just the way the cookie crumbles, man. So important concept here is you want to surround a city on all of its land, on all of its adjacent tiles with units that have zone of control. All melee units have zone of control. Range units do not have zone of control unless they're archers who get a particular promotion or ranged units that get a particular promotion. By controlling all tiles with a zone of control, uh, a zone of control is a projection of power that each melee unit projects onto adjacent tiles. This city will no longer heal every turn, which means it is under siege, which means when we do damage to it, that damage will not heal. And so we should be able to knock down Sarpsborg really quickly and it won't heal back. We probably don't even need these catapults, but they might be useful if we, and we will be going to war with Mongolia. Our goal is to conquer our continent, which is something you should consistently try to pull off as a prince player, try to like when you're playing on a continent's map, try to conquer your continent. I really want you to master offensive war. And honestly, sometimes even just load up a game, declare war on the AI and let them attack you. Pillage that, that's 83 science we just got from that, right? That's two turns of science. Imagine if you were placing a racing game that you have to move 250 like, like tiles to win. If you were able to move three tiles in one turn, that's such a huge thing. And that's the way I want you to think about pillaging. Pillaging is like I expended some resources earlier in the game to get some resources now, um, which is basically everything you do in this game. So we capture the city, we get the civilian unit that was sitting inside the city. And the second that we capture it, we immediately just get to work on what we would do in all of our other cities, right? We get the monument, we get the granary, we get this. We're going to repair the granary, we're going to build the monument, and then we're going to repair the campus. Um, the order of this does not matter. It's kind of a personal preference thing. I like to repair buildings usually before I build anything, with the exception of um, the monument. The monument has a higher priority, so I'll repair the granary, build the mon... Well, actually, maybe I'll even go monument first, because the monument, like, plus two culture, I know it doesn't sound like much, but it's actually just so much culture. It's insane how much culture it is. Again, it's like... A monument is like 400 culture over the course of a game. It's, it's a ridiculously efficient investment because you can get it so early. That is the key thing, is that it comes early into the game. Now, we're at 11 out of 11 population in here. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time getting a granary to give the city a little bit more housing room. Um, I do have potentially wonders. I could go for the Colosseum. 
I don't think I'm going to bother. I think instead I'd like to go for the diplomatic quarter. Um, so I'll finish the granary, go for the diplomatic quarter. Where you place the diplomatic quarter isn't super important. I would say try not to put it next to your government plaza, but do try to put it next to a city center. It doesn't have to be in the same city as the government plaza. But remember, one of the big key parts of this is that it gives plus one food, plus one production to all trade routes. So that's really, really damn useful. Also, we have a really nice theater square here. If we wanted to get six culture per turn, six culture per turn would allow us to get to nationalism much faster, which is a really important mid to late game to uh, civic that allows you to make your military stronger. So something to keep in mind. I will just go for the diplomatic quarter because I want to be able to play around the city state stuff. So I'll place the district to lock in its price and then I'll get to work on that granary. OK, Builder is over here in Mediolanum. Let's get that s s sugar or salt online rather, not sugar. And we'll keep moving these catapults forward. We don't need these catapults for this war. Probably. Probably, um, but it is good to just have them, you know, it's good. To, they're, they're useful. Um, do I want to build a bath? Yes, I think building a bath as Rome, it would give me plus four era score. I have eight turns to potentially get a golden age. If I kill Norway's capital city, I think I get era score. So I think building the bath is a good thing to do. It's on a tile that isn't particularly useful. Plus, because I'm playing as Rome, it's a unique building that gives an extra amenity and amenities are useful. So I think I would like to build a bath, although maybe it would be better for me to go straight builder. But I think, I think I'm gonna go for the era score here just because of the potential. Another really important thing about great generals is they give extra movement to catapults, which are two movement units. And so that's a 50% movement increase, right? And the other thing is they allow catapults to move and shoot, okay? It literally gives one of the slowest units in the game not only a massive increase to their mobility, but a massive increase to their mobility in a second way by allowing them to actually shoot and scoot, which is an ability they can't normally do. So very, 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 very important that you have great generals guiding around your artillery in the early game. In the mid to late game, there are other things that you can do. Oh my God, I can steal some iron. Yoink. Um, that's actually huge for us. I'm wondering, does anyone have iron that I could buy? No, you don't. Genghis Khan actually hates my guts, so he doesn't want to trade with me. Um, he's a little bit upset that I declared war on Norway, which is fine because we do plan to go to war with him afterwards. So he can, you know, in, in the immortal words of like internet trolls everywhere, stay mad kid, is what I have to say to him. We're going to just start slamming horses into his capital city? Yes. Because our goal is to just bring the health down slightly and maybe see if we can get one of his horsemen to come out of the city too. But yeah, we just need to start bringing the health down here. Let's go for a plantation on this tile. Boom. That's going to be an extra four. Like it's a four food, two gold tile, which is really reasonable. It'll help keep the city growing and maturing like we're all working on. Okay, awesome. There is uh, stirrups giving us access to the night, which gives us plus one food on pastures. And we will pop down a little mine there. Awesome. Boom let's get to work on military engineering. The reason that we want to unlock military engineering is because it will give us access to NITER. NITER is a strategic resource. Strategic resources give us access to new units. And also, uh, NITER actually increases the number of mines that we can have in our empire because NITER tends to appear on flatland where you can't normally build mines. And since mines are your primary source of production, researching NITER is actually a production, a net production increase in your empire. So strategic resources are quite important, particularly if they spawn and allow you to build mines on them. We have finished the stable in Aquileia. I'm going to quickly grab myself an extra horseman to support this war effort. This is a little bit of an unfortunate positioning of Norway's capital in the sense that it's quite hard for us to really get much done as it currently stands because we're taking a lot of damage attacking his city. Um, but if we just keep hammering it, we can bring the health down enough to where when these catapults get into position, they'll be able to rip it down and we'll be able to swoop in with a horseman and take it out. Okay, let's move you forward. You can now shoot the city and I do want you to. So shoot that city. Uh, now that my catapults are here, I don't need to slam with my horses. Slamming is just attacking a city, uh, if you're curious. So I can pillage and then fortify with my horses. You, sometimes it's actually better to fortify than pillage. I did it backwards. Sometimes I do things backwards cause I'm a silly man. Okay. Let's go ahead and move you right here, move you right there, move you right there. Now I've got all my catapults in position. A catapult standing here can't shoot this city because this is a hill tile and you, it's quite difficult to shoot over hills. This guy can shoot though because he's in position, uh, because there's open land in between them. You can shoot because this campus is on flat land and then the city has been brought low and we can kill Norway. Now, that was not Norway's last city, it seems. It looks like he has another city down to the southeast, so we probably won't be getting 
a golden age here, which is a little bit unfortunate, but there's not much we can do about that. But we did, we have effectively killed Norway. Um, if we take a look at his stats, he's got 19. I think I think that hasn't actually updated yet. Do I want to build a lumber mill here? I mean, it's almost always better to chop, but I do think a lumber mill on this tile is fine to give the city another productive tile. It's going to pay itself off over the long term. Honestly, play with your gut sometimes. Like, not every single decision has to be, like, perfectly analyzed. Honestly, if you play it by gut, you will... You'll learn so much more about who you are as a player. Like if someone steals a city's location and you're just like, I'm killing the world. You'll learn a lot about yourself, I swear. Oh right, we did just finish the bath, which was enough era score to get us a golden age, which is amazing. Um, it's a really good idea to go to war during a golden age because during a golden age, you get extra loyalty pressure. If I go in and have a look at these cities and I look at the loyalty here, you can see I'm getting negative loyalty from grievances, which means I need extra loyalty from some other source to offset that and if you're in a golden age your citizens exert more loyalty if a dark age is a really bad time to go to war i mean sometimes you just don't have a choice we also did just get another great general that's why i like to get a couple of these uh we can spread them out also this guy sun tzu can also just be turned into culture per turn he's like a free monument um if you already have a great general and you don't need a second one you can just that's a totally valid thing to do with sun tzu is just turn him into culture i'm going to take a moment here with my horseman to heal and when it comes to promoting horsemen, there's quite a few promotions that I think are quite good. Um, I would say going either left or right is really good here for the first two promotions. I, I personally, if you want to go more economic route with your horsemen, which is the route that I generally think is better, is to go for comparison into depredation. This will allow you to do a lot more pillaging in enemies' lands. If it's fairly early into the game and you're still using your horsemen for kills, Coursers allows you to deal with enemy siege and range units quite effectively, and double envelopment gives you extra flanking bonuses. If you don't remember what flanking bonuses are, basically you get a small combat strength bonus for every unit that's adjacent to an enemy in melee when you're doing a melee attack. So, um, yeah, that's, that's how that works. Now, let's come over here. We did build a horseman. I could get another horseman, and I think I will because I think Mongolia... Um, it would be nice to have just a little bit more of a swarm so we can get around, pillage, kill all of the cities and, and clear him out really, really quickly. And then we can kind of turn our attention on Sweden. Now, Sweden is a little bit stronger than these, these other two players that we've gone to war with. Uh, we will be looking for peace with Norway as soon as we can get it, which is two turns from now. We did finish the bath in Ravenna. What would be good to get in here? We could go for the industrial zone. It's not a, it's not a terrible move to go for an industrial zone. It's also not an amazing move. We could go for more military units. We could go for an economic building. So, for example, we could go for the commercial hub. There's a relatively good commercial hub spot right here. I do like that. Let's do it. Um, and I want the commercial hub for two reasons. A, I want to increase my gold income. And B, uh, it'll scale off of Hunza. And C, it'll get me a trade route. And trade routes are really, really effective. Super, super important. Remember, empire-wide infrastructure is some of the best stuff that you can get your hands on. Um, stuff that you can only get like a few times in your empire, typically going to be the mo most powerful me game mechanics that you interact with. And so that's something I want you to keep in your mind. Um, I do have a whole bunch of cash here, so I'm just going to go ahead and buy those horses and finally go ahead and improve that second copy. Nice. There's Divine Right, which gives us access to 50% more influence points. But more importantly, it gives us access to the Chivalry card, which will allow us to produce military units much faster. We don't have to switch to Monarchy. You can because it is technically a slightly better government. Um, you will lose a card, but you get better military cards. The monarchy switch is okay. It's not what I would consider to be an ideal switch, but things like retainers can help with loyalty. We're going to pop Republican Legacy in here, and then we will... I think we're still producing settlers, so having colonization for now is quite good. And then conscription to save us a little bit of cash on our army. So I think this is a totally reasonable government. You can kind of, you know, screw around with these different things, experiment with different things. Honestly, play the card game by feel in in my opinion just play it by feel don't worry about super hardcore optimizing install a mod that tells you exactly what you're going to get from every single card if you want now we have just unlocked trebuchets but before we upgrade units what we want to do is we want to unlock mercenaries mercenaries will give us access to the professional army card which gives us a 50 percent gold discount on unit upgrades which means you can upgrade twice as many units that is a huge deal um, it's one of the biggest deals in the game. Um, I should really go in, I should really do like a short on why you should never hard build units. You always want to be upgrading units when available because the production and gold efficiency of upgrading units is actually insane. Um, to put it in perspective, I think to build a trebuchet is 200 production or 
you can do it by building a catapult for 120 and then using 90 gold to finish the rest. And considering that four gold equals one production usually, that is an insane level of efficiency. It's actually ridiculous. Um, so it actually might even be 85 gold, which is even more efficient. It's, it's crazy. It's super good. Let's focus on filling out the top half of this tech tree. We're just going to grab any, like, something I do is I'll just scroll back and anything that has one turn on it, I'll just grab them. I'll just grab them because it, it, it fills out my tech tree a little bit. It puts me in a slightly better position technologically. And I, it just feels like the right thing to do. Okay, I do think it would be nice to get another commercial hub. I want to focus on keeping my gold income high, right? Because I have a military. That military has to be sustained. It has to be upgraded. So building a little bit of a gold income is the thing to do. Don't be afraid to crush flatland tiles. Flatland tiles, even with like wheat on them and with farms on them, and they have incredible yields, they will never be as good as a hill. You can judge the quality of a city, not by how much population it has, not by how much stuff it has, but by how many hills you can, you can put mines on in that city, okay? Mines are the fundamental currency of quality in Civilization VI. And that is why revealing tiles like this niter is so important because it gives you access to more high quality tiles, okay? It's a really simple, really basic, really important concept when you're playing the game. Now, we're one turn away from the medieval era. So that is what I would consider to be the classical era complete. We have most of the text from the classical era done. We've gotten a few from the medieval era. So now we're going to be playing around in the medieval era in the next episode. I want to thank you guys very much for watching. I love you all very much and I'll see you all next time. Bye bye.